Welcome to the Republican Professor. This morning we have an incredibly special guest, Dr. Lucas Morell. Thanks for being here, Lucas. Wonderful to be here, Lucas. <laughs> uh, and your name is spelled the same way as my name too, so that's that's cool. I've seen all <laughs> sorts of different kind of spelling of this name uh, with yeah. K and stuff like that. And uh, do you yeah. ever go by Luke? Uh, uh, I, only one person calls me Luke consistently. He's my mentor, uh, a professor named Bill Allen. And he just, for whatever reason, has always called me Luke and that he's the only one who does it. And I find it endearing. That is endearing. Some, the way it is with me, when people ask me Luke or Lucas, uh, which hardly anybody does ask me that, but I have had people ask me that. And it's the, the answer is, um, usually people just start calling me one or the other. And okay. they don't ask me my, usually it's, and then they, they stay with that the whole time. So some people since childhood for me have called me Luke and then, uh, and they never call me Lucas. And then other people have always called me Lucas. They never called me Luke. So I, I can't really figure it out, but you know, but, um, well, it's good to have you here and you're the author of this, uh, fantastic little book i haven't read the whole thing yet i haven't ha read every single word but what i have read i've some of it i've read twice and uh it's called lincoln and the american founding by lucas morell and it's published by southern illinois university press um and so this little book, it's about uh, 123 pages or so, I think. Yes. Covers all of the ground that in Lincoln, based on my perusal of it, that I think I would want in my founding class that I'm teaching right now. I'm teaching the American founding, which is a course originally developed by... Um, Oh my gosh, why am I blanking on his name? Such an important guy. He has a podcast for Claremont called Chris Flannery, of course. Oh, Chris Flannery is yeah. a good friend of mine, yes. Chris Flannery developed the course. I'm teaching it now, so this latest iteration. So I thought, you know, with all the monuments recently being torn down and stuff, uh, you know, and the students uh, seem, seem to have an increasingly low attention span, but I thought I have to get them into what Lincoln thought about the founders. And so your book is a perfect fit for that as far as I can tell. Thank you. Well, I really think I should stop talking for a second because you're the <laughs> one that wrote the dang book. It's how did you, uh, maybe this would be a good time to tell me that, tell us that anecdote that you, uh, you were talking about earlier be before we recorded you were oh. talking about how you got into politics and you, I think yeah you, said you were an engineering major i i was in high school i was pretty good at math and so everybody said you should be an engineer i had no idea what an engineer did and no one could define it either but you know you start getting catalogs from colleges junior senior year and i managed to get accepted to a school called harvey mudd college and it is oh, a college yeah. in it's in southern california it's one of the five Claremont colleges. Mm -hmm. And it's where a lot of people way smarter than I uh, go uh, if they don't get into Caltech or MIT. So I went, mm -hmm. in, I went into Harvey Mudd as a mechanical engineering major, but you have to declare a minor because um, you write a senior thesis when you're done. All the, all the Claremont colleges, you, as a senior, you write a senior thesis. Oh, so I, I pick politics. I love arguing. And I did this for three years, and, oh, wow. but the whole time I was really spending most of my time in my politics classes with a professor named Bill Allen. And wow. I consider him uh, my most important and significant mentor. Uh, and so after my junior year, I decided to transfer and make my minor my major. And so I changed my major to politics when I transferred to Claremont McKenna College. Oh, and wow. that's part of the consortium of colleges there wow. in uh, Claremont, which is near Pomona, uh, Pomona mm -hmm. uh, California. 
So anyway, that's how I actually got into the study of politics. And my study of Lincoln began in earnest when I transferred to Claremont McKenna, when I met two professors, James Nichols and Charles Kessler. And it was Kessler who was my thesis advisor. And I wrote my honors thesis on Lincoln's second inaugural and basically haven't looked back I, did, I worked on that for my dissertation in grad school and have basically been teaching Lincoln full or part-time for the past 30 years. Wow, what a great career. That's a wonderful career. That's a lovely career. You get to teach Lincoln for, know. for a job. <laughs> How cool yeah. is that? Yeah, I pinch myself every, every day. Oh my goodness. And where do you teach? I teach at Washington and Lee University. So I brought Lincoln to the land of Lee, which uh, is yeah. fantastic. So I'm here in uh, Lexington, Virginia, in the Shenandoah Valley. And um, yeah, I teach courses on political philosophy, uh, constitutional law, American government, and a seminar on Abraham Lincoln. I also teach a course on race and equality because you can't talk about American history without talking about uh, the pernicious role that race has played. And I think Lincoln is just a signature example of someone who had to negotiate uh, those yeah. uh, troubled waters at the, uh, the most troubled times in our nation's history. Yeah, I think uh, I, 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 especially with recent events, uh, seems like it's been a tough couple of years for a lot of people. And yeah. it, it, I take great comfort in reading Lincoln. Because I just think of what he was going through and what the country was going through. And I'm thinking, gosh, if, if there, there's such a wealth of, of resources for any time after that because of the, the insane times that, that Lincoln lived. I mean, I can't even yeah. imagine it. Do you, do, you, do, do you draw comfort from reading Lincoln? Is that why you um, I do. And uh, I do. Uh, the number one reason I teach Lincoln is because he teaches me about the founding. He teaches me about the country in which I was born. And um, I believe that there are things from that bygone era that are still applicable today. I think that they got some significant things right. And Lincoln thought the same. And next to reading the founders themselves, I think Lincoln is our best teacher of what the founders attempted to do, what they believed, compromises that they had to make and um, uh, for the sake of a higher good. And uh, I believe that it was from the founding that Lincoln drew most um, significantly in order to address the problems he saw, uh, or at least that they faced um, in his time, especially in the 1850s and early 60s. I was reading uh, just before we started recording uh, uh, one of the sections in uh, on your chapter on Lincoln, Washington, and the fathers. And on right. page 23, um, you're talking about this, the, the debate with Stephen Douglas and the issue of our fathers. And right. I th it's a very interesting point that you're making there that American heritage de derived not from blood but from creed and it's also kind of a biblical echo the idea of our fathers coming yes. from the Old Testament mm -hmm. um, and it was Douglas that was saying his opponent it was Douglas that was saying that the nation was really founded for white people I mean, he just says it. I mean, it's a quotation, you know? Yeah, it's very, he's very explicit and consistent with that. White basis. He's kind of yeah. the George Wallace. <laughs> right. Yeah, and it's it's pretty jolting because I'm used to being on campus. I'm used to uh, hearing uh, concerns about white nationalism or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, usually it seems to be uh, about something that doesn't seem to have anything to do with white nationalism at all. Uh, but here you have Stephen Douglas saying, yeah, this is white nationalism and Lincoln is opposing him. And he's saying, no, he you is. have the founders wrong. 
Yeah, and I hope um, uh, that one thing people can learn from my book is to see that in 1860 in particular, the nation had choices, political choices about the direction of the country, especially how to deal with the uh, growing agitation over what to do about slavery. Are we gonna let it go into the federal territories uh, or not? Are we going to reopen the slave trade? Okay, these were front burner policy issues of the day. And uh, of course, Lincoln as the standard bearer in 1860, the nominee of the Republican party, um, he thought slavery should not go into the territories and that Congress had the authority to stop it. Uh, Stephen Douglas disagreed. But a point I wanna make here is very few people know that when Stephen Douglas saw that Lincoln was going to become the next president, he actually gave speeches in the upper South to prevent them from seceding. They fell on deaf ears. But in December on Christmas Eve day, Douglas thought that the only way to save the country was to make white supremacy, as we like to say today, systemic. You know, wow. Race is not mentioned in the Constitution prior to you know, the Reconstruction Amendments, the 14th Amendment in particular. Right. Uh, but Douglas thought, you know what, I'm going to propose two amendments to the Constitution. This is in that interregnum between when Lincoln was elected in November and when he was inaugurated on March 4th, 1861. So on Christmas Eve day, Douglas proposes a 13th and 14th amendment. The first line of the 14th amendment said that black people could not vote or hold political office at any level, wow. territory, city, state, wow. or federal. He would make that an explicit part of the United States Constitution. You contrast that with our current 14th Amendment that talks about equal protection of the law for persons, right? Douglas thought, hey, maybe this is the bone we need to give to the South to prevent them uh, from seceding. But at that point, South Carolina was the only state that had claimed that it had seceded. Douglas said, fine, let's make whiteness a, an official part of our governing fundamental law, the constitution, so that black people, and of course, at that time, they operated on what we call the one drop rule. So he even included mulattoes, right? Even people who were part black could not hold political office, municipal, territorial, state, or federal, nor could they vote. He, he thought maybe if we make this a part of our constitution, that'll calm things down in the South. Now, it didn't go anywhere, but that shows you what the most important politician of the 1850s, which was Stephen Douglas, what he thought push come to shove would save the union is whiteness. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And that didn't work. <laughs> no, thankfully. But notice, no kidding. we would be having a different conversation today if yeah. it did work, if you will. In other wow. words, if there was sufficient constituency that would support representatives and senators, right? Because they would have to pass the amendment by two thirds in both houses of Congress. And then three fourths of the states would have to agree to that. If that had happened, then yes, racism is in our DNA as Nicole yeah, Hannah Jones yeah. infamous, uh, infamously said three years ago, uh, the Republicans rejected that. Now I'll hasten to add, mm -hmm. there were a lot of racist Republicans. I'm not saying that they were, they were uh, the, the woke party of the 1850s and 60s, but what I am saying is that was not a part of their platform, and it was certainly not a part of Lincoln's agenda as he campaigned for the presidency. Do you think that uh, Lincoln was a racist? No. Do you have any racist Republicans in mind that you're referring to back in the? Oh 18th no, I I can't I can't cite it. Well, but Horace you're Greeley thinking was, it's probably Horace Greeley. Horace Greeley, the most famous new newspaper editor of the day. Um, even though sometimes he sounded like an abolitionist, sometimes he was just strictly anti-slavery, but later, um, in the 1870s, um, he was, uh, explicitly racist in some of his editorials, but, uh, there are a number of, uh, not just Republicans, but abolitionists who <laughs> believe two things. They were against slavery and they were against black people. So, oh, wow. uh, yeah, so there, there, it wouldn't take long for, for me to find uh, some names for you along those lines, but I just hasten to add that in case somebody 
who really knows about that period saying, well, he seemed to suggest that the Republican Party was, you know, morally pure on the race question. No, I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is that I do not believe that Lincoln was a racist. And I thought that his leaning on the Declaration of Independence so much and his arguments for the sake of the natural rights of black people. Right. Were, were, it was, these were attempts of Lincoln to try to build a bridge from those who were more, um, uh, or not more, those who were racist, but were against slavery, trying to build a bridge to that constituency and to get them to take at least steps towards a more uh, universal understanding of um, the rights that, that all people possess. Yeah. We talked about this in class uh, yesterday. Um, we looked at the declaration closely and we, the topic was, is it a, uh, where's the, where's the declaration stand on racism or on uh, not racism on, um, on slavery? Sure. So what, what's your reading of the declaration on, on the question of slavery is, is it too simple to ask the question of whether it's an anti-slavery document or whether it's it's ambivalent about it? I think it's a an, an explicitly anti-slavery um, document, even as it complains about Lord Dunmore's proclamation, which is uh, which attempted to stir up servile insurrections. So what people don't uh, understand sufficiently about the American founding, especially the American revolutionary period, is that the founders could have been almost to a man, and I believe they were, anti-slavery and still owned slaves, but because there were impediments, obstacles right. to their practical implementation of the principles they came to believe in and you know, pledged to each other their lives, their fortunes, and sacred honor— uh, to secure. When the declaration says all men are created equal, that means a particular nature for a human being has been described to us. And that nature is equality. And one way that is expressed is that they are endowed again by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So uh, read uh, according to the plain text and according to the logic of that paragraph, the famous second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, um, it is categorically against slavery, right? Government hasn't been mentioned yet. So it's a very Lockean understanding of the natural equality of humans vis-a-vis -vis one another. It goes on to say that to secure these rights, in other words, the rights that you already possess simply by being right. human, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted. So the thing that is not natural, if you will, the thing that has to be created by human beings, government, that now we understand its purpose. In other words, government looks at everybody and says, oh, you already possess this super valuable thing, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Now, our job, government's job is to practically protect and make secure your freedom to exercise those rights, right? That's the point of government. And so in all of that, it is antithetical to slavery. And in fact, there is a, a paragraph that Thomas Jefferson wrote in his original draft that the Second Continental Congress deleted for reasons we can get into if you want to know. But sure. it was a paragraph that talked about the slave trade and it condemned King George III for, as, he, as, it, as Jefferson puts it, prostituting his negative, in other words, his veto power over colonial assemblies that attempted to ban the importation of slaves. In that paragraph, Jefferson refers to the sacred rights of life and liberty of the, the, of the Africans that were kidnapped, what he calls piratical warfare, the warfare of pirates. Jefferson condemned Middle Passage. He condemned the trade in slaves precisely because it violated the, what he called the sacred, and that means before the eyes of God, the sacred rights of life and liberty of the Africans that were stolen from their homeland and transport, transported over that horrific middle passage, the Atlantic Ocean, to get, most of them did not come to the United States. Most of them went to Cuba or South America, Brazil in particular. Uh, a small percentage came to the United States. But the fact of the matter is slavery was horrible and the beginning of trying to wean ourselves off of slavery in the United States 
was the attempt, and many colonies attempted to do this, but not all of them, was the attempt to stop the trade in slaves yes. so that that would prevent um, uh, the increase of the number uh, over time. And that was, I mean, they did that as well as prevented it yeah. from expanding into the Northwest Territory. So getting into the weeds there, but back yeah. to the declaration, I think both that- Well, the Northwest paragraph, Ordinance is a, is, a, is a thing that I find that my students have never heard about. You know, uh, yeah, and Jefferson drafted the original Northwest Ordinance in 1784. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so that what became Article 6, which I think is the concluding article that that prevents the importation or at least the spread of slavery into the Northwest or, or Northwest Territory, um, the only territory owned by the United States government at that time, um, that that's that that article and that. Uh, proposal in general was originally drafted by Jefferson. So do you think the, the anti-slavery impulse uh, in, and, and I'm noticing your book title, the American founding. Yeah. It's interesting that the word America and versus United States, a lot of people say the same thing. You know, I, I call myself an American, um, but People overseas typically say United States. Do you think the anti-slavery impulse is an American thing or is it a United States thing? Or is there a difference? Um, I would say it's both. I would say it's okay. American because it's it, uh, just, to, you know, the first line of the declaration refers to one people. When in the course of human events, it becomes yes. necessary for That's right. one people or a people. I forget the article there, but the point is, there yeah. was something that we all held in common. Yes, we were very pluribus, right? No, that's, pluribus, not a, that's not a racial thing, right? The people? You, I'm talking about, yeah, diversity think... in religion, diversity in mores and habits, religion. I'm not saying that we were drastically diverse, but growing up in Georgia is different than growing up in Massachusetts, okay? So right. each colony had their own distinctives, but there was something some things, plural, that they held in common. And this understanding of nation, that's what we mean by America. So yes, we are technically a, a union of American states, the United States of America. But to say that you are American came to mean something, and that was distilled in the Declaration of Independence, in my opinion. I think the Federalist and the beginning chapters might be the first one or second one i can't remember refer to one people right uh one yeah that's one john religion. jay john jay, john jay yeah. and federalist two uh yeah. really um emphasizes the ways in which we are common generally mm -hmm. speaking and mm -hmm. then he returns to it in federalist four to make the argument that <clears throat> even though we are one now we won't continue to be one unless we have a better national government, a government that superintends over all of the states and over all of the people, unless we have things, again, that we create or establish to reinforce and further inculcate oneness. If mm -hmm. we don't do that, guess what's going to happen? Remember, this is the point of Federalist 1 through 14. We don't do that, what he calls the political utility uh, of, of union. If we don't remain one United States of America, it's not that we're going to become 13 individual nations. We'll become probably three or four nations, what Publius referred to as partial confederacies. Uh, you know, Virginia can't go it alone. Georgia certainly can't go it alone. So odds are we would have become three or four separate but bordering nations, which of course would have led to different treaties, different alliances. We would have brought England and Spain and France yep. back into the United States and we would have replicated the horrors of Western Europe. And so that's what mm. Jay and Hamilton and Madison are arguing about yeah, in defending a union, a continued union, and therefore a strengthened government over that union in the first 14 essays of the Federalists. Uh, America. So so the English overtones in the fe those Federalist Papers was the, by Jay, the one people, one religion, it's an ethnicity in a sense that it's it's one, I think he's talking about Christianity from England. I think he's talking about the English language. But sure. do you think he's talking about how English people look? 
I don't, I don't think so because I don't recall him describing that. And I don't, no. even if he did, uh, that would be something that's accidental and not essential to our oneness. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm throwing out the kind of questions our my, my students might ask or, or people might sure. ask about, uh, racial issues now, because it is challenging. That's why we're so grateful to have folks like you to, who can sift through this material so masterfully and and see things that might not be otherwise apparent given mm. certain trends popular trends now i think um, yeah that make it harder those are obstacles yeah. that i as a professor have to clear away yeah so I bet. that they can see more clearly it's not it's not really no. I, I hope your listeners or viewers see this it's not a question of, hey, let me replace your ignorance with my knowledge or brilliance. Um, it, it's a question of removing obstacles to their understanding so that they can see yeah. things clearer. I, I, I trust them that once yeah. those obstacles are removed, they can read the declaration for what it says, read correspondence, read the Federalists and Anti-Federalists, read speeches, read court cases, you name it. Um, yeah, in a way good. that their, their preconceived notions don't get in the way. That's, that's very good. Uh, that's, that's insightful because, uh, when I teach this material, it's, um, I mainly teach philosophy. <laughs> I've mainly taught philosophy in my, uh, 15 years of teaching, but, uh, I've recently got into constitutional law, um, and, I um, I noticed that it seems like a lot of the students are primed to you're 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 familiar with the concept of priming, like uh, you know, like advertisers do this and stuff like that. They, it sounds like they're primed to be skeptical of of the documents, and yes. I feel like a lot of my students want to be patriotic, but they they there's something holding them back it's a false guilt or it's a confusion or something like that so that's why i really like how you put removing the obstacles yeah because and i have to say there were things in our nation's past that are not admirable that are not <laughs> worth holding on to that are not uh, that we ought not to be proud of and so i think that part right is healthy. We don't want to lose that. We want to be clear yeah. right about our past. The problem is we think the yes. bad things are the only things about our past yeah. and therefore we need a different future. And I look at it. I, I, I think we have to teach our students to be more capacious about how they look at history mm. and, and not make it just a good versus evil sort of thing. Yeah. And um, of course I'm bringing up that you teach it washington lee university once more um ha, ha, of course those those two people were either owned slaves or defended owned slaves. slavery both yeah owned slaves. okay so they both owned slaves they both uh, lee went to war to uh preserve uh the possibility of slavery um now he uh he was a civil man in many respects and he was um he was well regarded by many people who didn't approve of slavery how do you how do you understand uh, your position there as as a professor at that school uh, i'm mainly asking cuz i'm trying to anticipate what, what what some of my students might wonder yeah the easiest distinction and i draw a distinction between washington and lee on the slave question is okay um, that washington built a country that was devoted to getting rid of slavery in other words it built a country devoted to the idea that all men are created equal washington freed the slaves that he had legal authority over. Uh, he did not have authority over what were known as the dowager slaves, the slaves that Martha inherited from her previous marriage. He had no authority over those slaves, but his slaves were to be freed in his will at the death of Martha. And she actually freed them two or three years ahead of time. Um, one of his slaves, his body servant, um, I think his name was Billy, uh, was freed immediately. And then Washington strove to make sure that his estate would not go bankrupt the way Jefferson's did and that there would be enough 
uh, money to support those slaves that were too old or infirm uh, to work. Mm -hmm. uh, but Washington uh, tried to um, eliminate slavery. So, but the, the point, the bigger distinction is that Washington devoted his life to creating America and Lee spent the, <laughs> the years of the Civil War to destroying what Washington created. So for me, I, I, it's all praise for Washington and all criticism for Lee. However, hmm. when the war was over, Lee did not encourage, in fact, discourage guerrilla warfare. He said, we lost. We've got to, we meaning the South, have to build, we have to rebuild our part of the Union. And so he attempted, he was no, he was not woke by any stretch of the imagination. He was still <laughs> uh, uh, so, an old line white patrician. In other words, he right. did. He, he thought blacks were inferior in some respects. So I'm not saying he was progressive on that front, but what he spent the remaining five years of his life doing was accepting the position and acting as president of a boys college. That college was yeah. Washington College, and he basically saved it from bankruptcy. In other words, I wouldn't have my job but for what Lee did in the final five years of his life. So at Washington and Lee, we do not celebrate Lee as the patron saint of the lost cause. There is nobody at, at WNL that I know of who worships that Lee. Hmm. Um, those who speak favorably of Lee, and there aren't many, but those who do speak of favorably of him as our president for those five years. Um, okay. So that's how that's how I understand at least my own relationship to my employer, an employer whose two namesakes are both slaveholders. I think Washington's political achievements vastly uh, eclipse his own personal uh, involvement with slavery in terms of owning slaves. Uh, and in terms of Lee, I mean, I'm a Lincoln guy, so I think Lee was a traitor, but um, he's, his name as part of Washington College, now Washington University, because we have a law school, his name is there because he was our president for the, fast, the last five years of his life. Gotcha. I never knew that. Oh, that's interesting. That's helpful to know. And both Washington and Lee are were devoted to uh, education. Uh, and you remember, Lee was a, a superintendent of West Point. But at West Point, he had no, he had almost no authority. Everything he, I mean, if he wanted to, to buy pencils, he had to send that up the chain and get it approved. At Washington College, he essentially had carte blanche to do whatever he wanted because his reputation was so great that the board of trustees basically were, uh, you know, a pro forma, uh, 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 oversight. L what Lee wanted, he got. And in some respects, those were some of the happiest, if not the happiest years of his life, uh, because he had authority to do and exercise his will as he saw fit. And is that college in the Shenandoah Valley? Yeah, it's in Lexington, Virginia. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Do you ever hear owls or anything at night? I have to ask, because I love owls. No, we have bats. Uh, you have bats? Oh. Yeah, we don't have owls that I know of. I mean, you ever see do, snakes? Few and far between. What's that? You ever see snakes? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, we've yeah. got water here, so yeah, we get we've got water moccasins. Oh no! Oh my goodness! Seen them on the golf course. Oh, is that right? Wow. Yeah. That's that sounds delightful. It sounds like a a dream. <laughs> um, I love that stuff. I mean, I'm in Southern California, and it the desert area. It's just the wildlife, the, the paucity of wildlife gets to me. But I have seen owls on Claremont, actually. I've seen a uh, barn oh. owl at, at CGU, and I've I've seen several great horned owls on Pomona College uh, over the years. We so, have an occasional eagle, and that's pretty awesome. Oh, that's cool. A bald eagle? Yeah. Oh, hey, even better. There's not a lot of them, but we've seen them on occasion. I... Uh, I, I, I think it was a uh, recent years. I, I was going through constitutional law and we were talking about Prig versus Pennsylvania. Are you yes. familiar with that case? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Joseph story wrote the opinion and it, it's a, it's a gut wrenching opinion about the fugitive slave uh, clause. It was a, a runaway slave that escaped into Pennsylvania. If my memory serves me correctly. And, um, the question was whether the bounty hunters could go across the state lines and get them, um, 
and um you know the the resolution was that the constitution required uh deliverance of the of the slave back to the quote unquote owner um but the year before that that was 1842 the year before that was the famous case that was made into a movie uh called Amistad the Amistad schooner case and right. it was virtually the same court and they freed those slaves mm -hmm. and it's just an interesting uh window into that time i think that my students had a hard time understanding how they could they could you could have totally different resolutions of of these right. slavery issues of course the Amistad had to do with uh, some international law stuff, and really, exactly. it it turned on the, the the claim of that they had been kidnapped, and there there was fraud, and uh, uh, remind the thing you mentioned about Jefferson, uh, what he where he wanted to ban the the kidnapping uh, slave trade, reminded right. me of that. Um, but there was this compromise in the constitution and um i wondered if uh you could tell us how you think of that that compromise you i think you've sure. alerted alluded to it earlier you've alluded to the threat in the federalists the early federalists that we could be carved up by the great european powers and and right. we would just become another europe and we would yeah. lose that one people and and the security of that so I mean, the way I try to get my students, um, well, here, here's here's how I present it. Um, to be free, we had to be united. In other words, there was no way uh, Virginia and New York on their own were going to defeat the British, right? And in fact, betting money in Vegas, haha, -ha, was that 13 colonies united were not going to beat the British, right? The greatest right. sea power uh, of right. the world at that time. But suffice it to say, it's not a, so much of a syllogism, but I say to be free, we had to be united. To be free, and in, to be free we had to be uh, uh, independent. And to be independent, we had to be united. In order to achieve unity, we had to make compromises. And compromises, the, the, the signal one, the most significant one, was the compromise over slavery. Slavery right. was understood not as a national, but as a state institution. And so we had to say, well, for those for that institution and other domestic institutions, um, we're uh, not going to try to unify and get rid of slavery at the same time. Um, we couldn't, if you will, free ourselves and free our slaves at the same time and have and fight a successful war against the British. Now we keep bringing up Jefferson. We have to remember Jefferson was president when the Fugitive Slave Act was first. Uh, not the Fugitive Slave Act, but the, the non-importation of slaves bill was passed. Remember the Constitution That's said right. Congress saw, could not yeah. prevent it until 1808. It yeah. did not require that it be prevented in 1808. But in March of 1807, sure. Congress passes a bill and Jefferson signs it to take mm -hmm. effect as soon as constitutionally permissible. So on January 1st, 1808, you could no longer bring slaves into the United States. It was illegal. And in 1820, to add more teeth to that bite of the law, it was equated with piracy. And the only punishment for piracy at the time was capital punishment, to be hanged by the neck until dead, as they put it. And so in 1820, we equated the importation of slaves with piracy. What's different in Amistad as opposed to Prig, Prig is dealing with a not just a law. The Fugitive Slave Act at the time was the 1793 Fugitive Slave Law. Why did we have a Fugitive Slave Law? That's because right, there was a right. Fugitive Slave Clause. There's an actual provision yeah. in the Constitution that requires that the slaves be returned. <laughs> but unlike fugitives from justice, like a murderer or a thief, someone else who commits some crime in one state and flees to another, the constitution is very specific that the head of the, the state to which that um, alleged criminal escapes to 
The governor is responsible to return them. That, that is not explicit when it comes to the return of slaves. And that's what leads right. to print. Yeah, so what yeah. Story says essentially is, um, look, the Constitution requires that this take place. And we have to decide, is it a state or a federal responsibility? And Story says it's a federal responsibility. Yeah, right. So that's the holding of Prigvi, Pennsylvania, is it's just going to be the federal government now. And states have nothing to do with it um, at all going forward. Then, of course, it's uh, the, the law seven years after Prig, seven or eight years after Prig um, gets revised. And that's the notorious Fugitive Slave Act that we're more familiar with where an alleged fugitive from, from slavery doesn't have benefit of counsel, cannot speak in his own behalf. If a posse comes to your door, uh, a sheriff uh, or a federal commissioner comes to your door and says, hey, I deputize you, you have to join a posse to go uh, uh, apprehend this alleged fugitive slave. You could not refuse. If you did, they would throw you in prison and fine you. And the last bit of good news, wow. haha is the commissioner who who runs the trial, he gets paid five bucks if he says the alleged fugitive slave um, is not really who we're saying he is and gets paid $10. Talk about good enough for government work. He gets paid twice the amount if he says, yeah, on the only evidence we have, which is from the bounty hunter or the actual owner of the slave, that's that's good enough for us. That's the guy, send him back. The judge got paid 10 bucks and the overwhelming number of cases uh, I had a friend of mine, Jonathan White at Christopher Newport University. He looked this up less than 20 of the alleged fugitive slaves were were exonerated, not enough evidence to convict. And uh, either in the upper 200s or low 300s, um, they said, yep, that's the guy um, you can take him back. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, yeah, horrible Fugitive Slave Act. So the the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 was was one thing, and then you had a worse one as it time went on. You it yes. got worse. Yes. The closer you get to the founders, it was actually a mo mollified to some extent. Relative. Yeah, it was it was more vague about how it was actually going to be carried out. But Lincoln okay. insisted that look, as bad as we think returning fugitive slaves to their owners, their legal owners is, it is a provision in the constitution. We can't ignore it. We are a constitutional people. We are a rule of law people. What he did amazingly though, in 1858, mm -hmm. in his debates with Stephen Douglas, um, in his acceptance speech in June, 1858, when he was unanimously nominated by the Republican party to replace Stephen Douglas as Senator, Lincoln brings up the Fugitive Slave Act and he says, we have to abide by it. We can't be like those abolitionists who say, let justice be done though the heavens fall. We have to show that we are supporters of all of the constitution, even the parts we don't like. But that doesn't mean Congress can't revise the Fugitive Slave Act to make it less likely that kidnappings could occur under cover of fugitive slave uh, uh, apprehension. Yeah, so he was and give actually due process. trying to address the inequities of the 1850s uh, Fugitive Slave Act. Gotcha. He yeah, also there's brings it there's up denial again of in due the process. inaugural address. Yes, Sorry, say that again. Process. Yeah, he yeah, also yeah. brings it up again in his first inaugural address. The first inaugural is not as famous as the second one. Uh, no, it isn't. But uh, there's some gems in the first inaugural. I'm going to have sure. to take a look at that He's again. thinking after all. <laughs> Yeah, there's gems everywhere. Let me go through the uh, the table of contents. I, sure. I wanted to do that earlier. Usually I do it right away just to give people a sense of what they can expect in this book. Um, so, okay, so the, the introduction is called Looking to the Past for the Sake of the Future. And then you have uh, five chapters and a conclusion. So seven chapters total. I love that number. Lincoln, the chapter one is Lincoln, George Washington, and the founding fathers, an appeal to the founders, to, to the founder par excellence. And that chapter I've read uh, carefully, and it's all about what Lincoln thought about George Washington. Yes. Um, and there's a lot of interesting detail in there that um, 
some of it I, I hadn't heard before. This chapter two is Lincoln and the Declaration of Independence, an appeal to the founder's ends. And you do, you give a close reading of these texts, which is the method I like. Um, chapter three is Lincoln and the Constitution, an appeal to the founders' means. Ah, yeah. And then chapter four, Lincoln and slavery. Just getting right to it. Uh, an appeal to the founders' compromise, which is what we're alluding to recently in the last few minutes. And then chapter five, Lincoln and original intent and appeal to the founders relevance. And then there's a conclusion, Lincoln as a conservative or a conservative liberal or liberal conservative. What do you mean by those terms, liberal and conservative? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're, 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 the they can be kind of confusing. Um, I'm, I'm pretty simple. Um, I look at words in terms of their basic denotative meanings or definitions. So if you are a conservative, forget even politics, but if, if okay. you're a conservative, that means you're interested in conserving something. In other words, there is something currently or right. in the past you want to hold on to. If you're a liberal, there is something that you want to free yourself from or for. And so when we think about the American founding, and Lincoln thought about the founding probably more deeply than any American since Washington, Jefferson, and Adams. Uh, uh, Lincoln thought, looking back to the founders, there were significant things he thought that they got correct that will never be improved on, that are fixed, eternal, universal. And he found those in the Declaration of Independence. So to that extent, Lincoln is conservative. He thinks the things in the declaration, what I'm calling the ends of the American regime, why we exist, what our purposes are, what our aims are, Lincoln says these are fundamentally sound. In other words, he does not believe America is, as we say today, systemically racist. He thinks we are profoundly good. Now, it, it, he's a conservative in wanting to hold on to that. And of course, he saw something back there he thought we should get rid of, slavery. But how we do it was important. And that mm -hmm. leads us to the chapter on the Constitution. The yeah. Constitution is a mechanism of means. These are levers by which the American people um, uh, try to achieve the ends, as I understand it, as I've been taught by Lincoln, the ends spelled out in the Declaration. We see that most clearly in the preamble when it talks about the blessings of liberty, for example. But most of the document, most of the Constitution are how, not why. How are we going to do this? We're going to do this through separating the powers, right? Even though separation of powers isn't explicitly mentioned, we actually do it Article 1, Article 2, Article 3, Congress, Executive, Judiciary. Right. So what makes Lincoln a liberal is the ways in which he thought the American founders were devoted to liberty or freedom, okay? So the fact that they were devoted to freedom, even though they were slaveholders, they were erecting, they were establishing, they were founding a regime devoted to freedom, not to the continuance of slavery, even though slavery did continue because we were a federal system. In other words, it was left to the states to figure out what they were gonna do about it. Yeah. Slavery was, it was legal in the original 13 colonies and within um, the a generation of the, of the revolution, eight of the original 13 got rid of slavery, okay? In Massachusetts was the only one that got rid of it by court edict. It was the first one to do so. They ratified a new state constitution in 1780 and within three years, by lawsuits brought by the slaves themselves, a court, a judge, declared that slavery was no longer wow. constitutional in the state of Massachusetts. In the remaining states that got rid of slavery, and especially New Jersey and New York, because there was a lot of slavery up there, they were, um, slaves were uh, what they called gradual manumission laws, that emancipation would take place over time and part of that had to do with uh, the number of slaves who were minors. In other words, you, hmm. you couldn't just immediately declare them free. Um, who's gotcha. going to be responsible for them, et cetera. So uh, in, in certain how, cases. How did those uh, those plaintiffs have standing? 
uh, in those initial had, cases? Um, in the case, probably the most famous case is a case of a woman named Kwok, uh, excuse me, a woman named um, Mum Betts, otherwise known as Elizabeth Freeman, Mum Betts, M-U-M-B-E-T-T-S. Mum Betts, an enslaved woman in 1781, sued for her freedom because she was abused by her owner. In Massachusetts, there were laws against beating your slaves. Um, oh. You couldn't murder, you couldn't mistreat them. And she, I think, was protecting her, her daughter and um, would, you know, defended her daughter against the, her owner. And it, long and short of it is she took that to court. And then Quack Walker is a, uh, an enslaved man who a couple of years later sued for his freedom. What was remarkable is it's one thing to, to liberate a particular slave or group of slaves their lawsuits actually produced abolition in Massachusetts. Wow. In other words, the judges looked at the Massachusetts Constitution, and unlike the U.S. Constitution, their Bill of Rights came at the beginning, not at the end. And the first line of the Massachusetts Constitution is the first line of the Bill of Rights says, all, I think it says, all men are born free and equal. And the judge saw that and he said, huh, and of course, men at that time meant men and women. Kind of a, that's a key point. I'm glad you I'm glad you point that out. Sorry. I don't know how that happened, but no anyway. problem. Yeah, I'm glad um, you pointed out the, the gender thing because uh that is a tripping point for some people who don't read dictionaries like I do. <laughs> and the the old you know, it's not very long ago. I don't know about the new dictionaries, but but the uh, the standard dictionaries for hundreds of years would have, if you look up man, the very first definition is human being. And yeah, then, and, then and, it's an adult male human being. So. Yeah, look, look, um, the, I, I mentioned that deleted paragraph. In that deleted paragraph, yeah. Jefferson says, where men are bought and sold. Nobody thinks that he means males. <laughs> men are bought and sold. They know it means what? Men, women, and children are bought and sold. So the uh, word men meant human beings. But even if you don't look at the deleted paragraph, what does the declaration say? Governments are instituted among what? Governments are instituted among men. Men, yeah. Are we saying that governments are only instituted among males? No. So even the, the wording of the declaration itself indicates that the, the, the language of that second paragraph is meant to apply to all human beings, not just males. But getting back to the, the Massachusetts case, what the judge read is he said, our constitution, because it says all men are born free and equal, that has to apply to the enslaved as well, because we all know they're human beings. And then he goes on to say, and it would be inconsistent with the spirit of the revolution. In other words, he drew a connection from Massachusetts new constitution in 1780, which was principally written by John Adams. And he drew a connection between this, the Massachusetts constitution framed as it was to the declaration's political th philosophy. And he says, he's basically said, the revolution was about freedom, not slavery. And our constitution needs to be read in uh, uh, consistent with that, aligned with that. How is it possible that we have slavery in our state and so in a matter of two or three years, it is no longer legal. It's not constitutional to enslave a person in the state of Massachusetts. That's the spirit of 76. Wow. So now there is this uh, obviously north-south split, and it's a geographical yes. split. How do you explain that split between uh, uh, along geography lines? uh in terms of the the impulse to uh, ban slavery or or maybe uh, to speak in biblical terms uh the temptation to keep it yeah um, and i've never been tempted to own another human being that's not a temptation that i struggle with but apparently it, it was quite powerful for a lot of people so yeah uh, it, assuming it, it is it, a sin i think lincoln was right it is a sin yeah, well, one major distinction, of course, is the South was primarily um, ag uh, agrarian in the yeah. way that they made their living in contrast to the North. Now, that isn't, you know, 
ironclad because Virginia had a fairly diverse economy, although it still was based um, principally on slavery. One thing we don't mention enough is the invention of the cotton gin. Uh, uh, believe it or not, the cotton gin, as crude a uh, machine as it was, was a technological innovation. It was a new way to um, separate the, the, the wool from the, you know, the seed and the chaff and the stuff that you, you, know, you don't want as a part of the thing you're going to spin into yarn. When the cotton engine, the cotton gin was invented in whatever, 1792, 1793, notice after the constitution right. was ratified, right. nobody foresaw that, foresaw that in the 1770s, right. 1780s. In fact, at the actual convention, at least one of the delegates mentioned, you know what, it looks like slavery is gonna be, you know, going the way of the dodo. In other words, it, it doesn't look like slavery is gonna be with us forever. So this is a problem that in, in God's providence, will be, you know, will go away over time. They really didn't think slavery was going to exist for that long. Cotton gin is invented. And now if you can find a way to harvest lots of it, yeah. you can make yourself a bundle by producing raw wool, but how do you harvest it? You need a lot of hands. And so in places that were, if you will, land rich, but people poor like South Carolina and Georgia, they could not in their minds, and I'm not justifying this at all, but this was the excuse they gave themselves. Sure. The excuse they said was, well, well look, we can't, we can't survive down here without slave, without slavery. And so uh, with the cotton gin, it made it much more difficult, as you put it, to resist temptation to enslave a fellow human being. Yeah. And the devotion to large scale plantation plantations given yeah. over now to cotton rather than hemp, indigo, rice, uh, and tobacco. Now cotton became king. Uh, at that point, it became, at the turn of the century, 1800 going up, you just see the charts. It's astronomical how high now, how much of cotton is being exported from the United States um, to be refined overseas. Um, and so that, that, I'm sorry to put it, but that technological innovation made it easier for people to do what they grew up doing, which was right. exploiting right. the labor of fellow human beings for the sake of making a living. Yeah. I think it made it harder for, uh, I really like that you brought that up. Uh, it may, it seems like, and I'm, I'm going back to the biblical terms because Lincoln himself viewed the whole war in the second inaugural in biblical terms. And he yes. quotes the Bible, um, which I love teaching. Old New Testament. Yeah, and and he doesn't say I'm quoting the Bible now. Uh, you know, he didn't he need quote, to. He didn't need to, and that's that's an interesting point that a lot of folks that are less biblically literate now don't understand, is just how biblically literate people were. Yeah. Um, so that he could quote Matthew 18. Now, I mean, I read the quote and I know he's quoting the Bible because he's it's King James language. And I grew up on the King James. I, I know it. I know the language. I know the feel of it. And so, you know, I can now you can look it up pretty easily. Mm -hmm. But it seems like people knew what he was talking about when he said that. That if you cause one of these little ones to stumble, which is the context of Matthew 18, that you really have deserve the death penalty. You deserve to have a millstone hung around your neck and, and drown in the depths of the sea. Mm -hmm. And uh, I forget which part he quotes in the, in the second inaugural, but it's in that it's within a verse of that uh, in Matthew 18. Um, I, I think it's, um, it's something about kids stumbling, um, causing children to stumble, referring to, I, the way I read that is there's people that grow up seeing slavery and they see it as normal and then they grow up and they're now citizens and they vote and they, they now uh, they're in charge now, but that's how mm -hmm. they grew up. And that was normal for them. Now, if you have a shorter growing season in the North, do you fair, think it's fair to refer to the, the, the shortness and length of the growing season? you might have less of a temptation to that sin. And it's not like 
the northerners are inherently holier or something like that like if you're from yeah, Massachusetts. Lincoln never said that in yeah, fact, yeah, yeah. Pains to say the opposite he explicitly said if we were in their position we would behave in no otherwise in other words we wouldn't be abolitionists if we were born in South Carolina. He said we would be doing exactly what they were doing. And that's because of the technology. Human nature. That, yeah, human nature. Yeah. The technology made it tougher to resist temptation. I think that there's lessons there about all sorts of things. A temptation mm -hmm. that te technology brings to us stuff that, that, uh, previous generations might not have struggled with. Um, <clears throat> when you come to the topic of Lincoln and the founders, um, can you give people a realistic sense, Dr. Morell, of just how much there is to sift through and, and how much work it is to go through this? Is it when you were, when you were first studying this stuff at mm -hmm. Claremont, was that a tough thing or did you, did you feel like your, your mentors there were really key in pointing you in the right direction? Um, my mentors were helpful because they were steeped in the writings of the founders. Mm -hmm. And once I turned my attention to Lincoln, the more I read of Lincoln, the more I thought, my goodness. Um, yes, Lincoln is steeped in, there are a number of influences in, in Lincoln's life, the Bible, Shakespeare. He loved the poetry of Robert Burns. But the more I looked into what Lincoln was doing as an engaged citizen and the speeches he was giving more often out of office than in office, the more I realized, wow, as much as he is influenced by the Bible, he really does turn the gaze of the American people to the American founding and in particular, the Declaration of Independence. So for him, the Declaration of Independence, as I said earlier, spells out why we exist as a country. And, and, and that was our, our lodestar, the thing that should direct our, our, our path, or the, not the path, but the thing that should direct our steps. Um, and that the constitution was the means as an expression of the consent of the people, that was the only way we could try to achieve those ends. And that's what made getting rid of slavery difficult because the constitution, which was agreed to by all the states, limited, the federal government's power over that domestic, that internal institution. And so where it could deal with it at the, the state or at, uh, at the uh, federal territorial level, yes. Foreign powers, yes. And the interstate level. The, in those three categories, the Congress can act, the president can act. But within a state itself, Congress can't ban slavery, it can't uh, ameliorate it. it. It is left to the states themselves to deal with it. And Lincoln insisted, uh, especially as a Republican, that, that, would, that, that they had to abide by the constitution even as they tried to get rid of the thing that had to be compromised with, which was slavery. And so in yeah. reading Lincoln, I saw so many um, attempts of his to direct the citizenry to understanding the declaration and the writings of the founding, but especially the declaration as a way of helping them deal with the, the, the question of slavery, the growing controversy over slavery that consumed America in the 1850s. Now he didn't have the benefit of a formal education. He didn't have. Not much. Uh, he obviously didn't have the internet which probably a good thing <laughs> all, all considered, but, uh, but it's hard to imagine for me how he was getting these sources because well, I learned so much about the founding reading his his stuff, but it's like, but where is he getting this material is, is were there was, libraries or were there? Yeah. Well, he was in Congress for one term, 1847, 1849. And therefore the closest thing to the internet was the library of Congress. So he could check out any book that it held which was all the books that were being published at that time. <laughs> Prior to the Library of Congress, Lincoln was, was borrowing books from everybody he could, uh, especially lawyers who had significant libraries. Hmm. Um, there were not that many law schools at the time. Right. So he, Stephen Douglas, and many men who went on to become attorneys, they didn't go to law school. They just, what, what they called at the time, they read the law with a local attorney, which meant the local attorney would give them books give them the state statutes and then 
they would say, come back to me when you've got questions. And then <laughs> once there was sufficient mastery of the material, you would go before a judge, he'd ask you a few questions, and then you would go to the bar, a literal bar, and go get drinks and celebrate the fact that you were now an attorney. So mm -hmm. Lincoln found books through a number of different um, uh, neighbors. Uh, and, and he traveled widely on circuit as an attorney uh, in Illinois and, and through surrounding states. Um, and, you know, he, he, he got the books where he could. And the most important ones, he poured over those. You know, I'm, I'm trying to place your accent. Um, I don't I know where in you, Southern California. You did. What Born in New York, California? but obviously didn't spend too much time there. I, I, I was raised in the San Gabriel Valley. Oh, okay. A town called Alhambra, which is just south of Pasadena. Sure. Yeah. I know that area. Not so very suburb well, of LA. I, yeah. 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 Did, yeah. Now wh what's your ethnic heritage? If my you don't mind my asking. Oh, don't mind at all. My folks are from the Dominican Republic. Dominican Republic. Do they speak Spanish? Your folks? Oh, yeah. 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 Did you grow up speaking Spanish? I did not. Um, Entiendo, pero no puedo hablar. In other words, I understand it, but I can't speak it. What my parents, when yeah. they came to the States in 1962, and I was born in 64, they, they said that your future is in this country. And in this country, you need to know the language. You need to know English. And so unlike my college freshman roommate who grew up in San Diego, who has a Mexican heritage, in his household, they spoke only Spanish. Uh, so he grew up truly bilingual. I, I grew up not bilingual. So my, my Spanish is horrible. Okay. So you mainly just got yelled at in Spanish. Maybe I don't know. Not yelled at me. Well, yeah, okay. sure. I got yelled at, but they spoke, when we came home from school, they spoke Spanish to us and we responded in English. I gotcha. I gotcha. Now, uh, do you consider yourself, uh, Hispanic then or yes. black? Okay. I, well, look, if you look you at me, a I'm a black Dominican. Black if you look Dominican. at me, I'm a black Dominican, but I am, right. my, my, my culture, my heritage is Hispanic American. I mean, there is a difference between growing up, uh, as we say today, African American in the United States and growing up a Hispanic American. Those are two different, I mean, broad categories to be sure. Um, the, 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 those are two different ways of looking at the world. I grew up, you know, my ethnic food was Dominican. It was, it's hmm. not soul food, if you will, to, to use, again, broad categorization. So absolutely, culturally, um, Southern California, Hispanic. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I grew up in the Catholic church, that sort of thing. Gotcha. Okay. And uh, how did your parents feel about you, uh, your choice of, uh, <laughs> of um, your scholarship and, and, you know, or actually your profession, like going and being a professor? Oh, they're, they're eminently, prof they're super proud because neither of them went to college. I don't think either of them graduated from high school, but you don't have to be a rich person to know that education gives you options. Yeah. So I, I don't know. We were, if you had, if you had to classify me economically growing up, we were at best lower middle class. Okay. That said, we gotcha. had the world book encyclopedia on our shelves. How on <laughs> earth? My parents were able, and my mom, this is traditional Hispanic family. The woman does not work. She works at the house. Father provides for his family. And right, I, right. we were a family of seven. Oh, Mother, wow. Father and Holy five cow. kids. Wow. So we have a big family. So my dad was, I mean, he was, uh, he had his day job. And what did he, he do for a living? Your he dad. worked at a wire corporation, Davis Walker Wire Corporation, a steel factory in Southern California. But he was real like a handyman. He would, you know, run the machines, fix the machines, paint the machines, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, how my parents could afford encyclopedias is beyond me. So even yeah. though they themselves weren't spending hours reading these books, they knew we needed to have those resources. And so nobody told me to read the encyclopedia. They were there. So I pulled them so off the shelf off, yeah. and I would look at what I wanted to look at. And there were other books along those lines. So the, the number one thing here is, education, education, education. They knew that in yes. this country, if you could get an education and applied yourself, you could go places. Well, you're living proof of that. And and to I go to the Claremont so. colleges that from Alhambra, I mean, I'm picturing uh, the San Gabriel Valley and, and how it kind of goes over to Claremont and yeah. Claremont, Claremont is a, for those of you listening the uh, reason I mentioned your, your heritage and what you look like is because I can see you and people on YouTube can see you, but 
but uh people listening on apple podcasts and spotify and stuff they they can't see you they only hear you gotcha um and and claremont if you don't know uh southern california claremont is a very swanky area i mean it's so for me, I mean, I look at it and it's a great Halloween neighborhood, these big houses and <laughs> trees. And it's a, it's a cool town. Actually. Yeah. It's a beautiful town. And, and, and it's a, it's got several colleges, I think what, six now or seven, something like that. Five, five Claremont colleges, uh, yeah. the Claremont graduate university where I got my PhD and the right. Claremont uh, school of theology. Yeah. Yeah. So it's got these really nice colleges and so when you say Harvey Mudd, I mean, that's like an expensive college, you know, and Claremont McKenna, that's, those are really, those are really top-notch schools. I was looking at the ranking and I think Claremont McKenna was above Harvard for a while, like in terms of, of teaching a liberal art kind of, uh, right. not research necessarily, but teaching. Yeah. These aren't research one schools, R ones as we call yeah. them. So that's a big deal that you were able to go there from from those roots and uh, have the education you uh, you did. And you mentioned um, Charles Kessler and James Nichols. I don't know James Nichols as much as I do. I know Charles. And Bill Allen. Bill Allen was my politics professor at Harvey Mudd. He was I probably met a him. significant intellectual influence, although I did most of my work with Charles Kessler at Claremont McKenna College. And did you know, and you knew Michael Yulman? Oh not, yeah, not but Michael time, wasn't yeah. there. Yeah. Michael Yulman wasn't at Claremont Graduate School when I was there. He came later, but I knew the great Harry Jaffa. Oh, he was there when yes. you were there. That's cool. That's yes. cool. He I met our, him a couple he, times. Yeah, he was our philosophical he, godfather for sure. Yeah, he. I think I saw him in the library down there. Now, what was it like with him? Did you ever take a class from him? Yeah, I did. But with with Harry at the time, um, he was, you know, he was he was getting on in terms of his age. Yeah. And so it didn't honestly, it didn't matter what course you took with him. Like, like for example, as I recall, I think I signed up for a course on the Nicomachean Ethics by Aristotle. And <laughs> yeah. I don't know, we might have spent five minutes on that. But <laughs> Harry was so his his knowledge in reading remember he was an english uh, major at yale before he turned to political philosophy and study with leo strauss so he knew his shakespeare wow. so if you were if you were in a class with harry it had an ostensible topic or theme but he just talked about whatever he wanted to talk about and so you were learning about plato you were learning about shakespeare he was at lincoln um, he was all over the map so he wasn't uh, i mean you know i took a course on montesquieu and with bill allen Bill Allen has it in the French and he's translating as he's speaking to you from the original French. And of course, wow. I don't know French, so I'm, I have a translation. So Bill is taking you line by line through, through Montesquieu. Yeah. With very, Jaffa, very organized. Yeah. And with Jaffa, you didn't get that. It was Jaffa would show up. And again, you'd start with Aristotle, but you were quickly, uh, you know, talking about Lear or Hamlet or Macbeth or you know plato's gorgias i mean or the republic it, it, it you it was hard to be prepared for a jaffa class yeah and you strike me as someone who likes to be prepared for class so how did oh, that sure. strike you as uh <laughs> what, what were you saying on the student evaluations <laughs> did, did you like that or did that rub you the wrong way do you oh, feel like I, you weren't I, you prepared know, for that i couldn't i couldn't tell you at, th at this point in time i couldn't tell you what i would put in any of those evaluations when you look back on it, do you feel differently now about that style of teaching than you did at the time? No, because if you're going to tell me, you know, you could, it was this way or nothing, I would take Harry, jo I would take Harry Jaffa, you know, and, and talking about anything, reading a cereal box, I would learn from, from Harry. Um, so I didn't care. The most systematic teacher I had was Charles Kessler. Oh, Yes. I had him too for four he, classes. He yeah. was his lectures were just flawless, and I think he yes. got that from his teacher Harvey Mansfield. Yeah, well. that's right. That's right. So I I don't I I don't know that. Well, maybe Kessler would have lectured the same way, but from what I hear, and I've never taken a class from from Professor Mansfield. Mansfield's also the same kind of just flawless. Yeah, just you just ask a few questions along the way, but 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 you you were there because Harvey Mansfield has has read the. The, the Prince by Machiavelli yeah. a million times 
and you're in better Italian. off setting up and, and taking it all in and then try to come up with a question later. Yeah, I appreciated that about uh, Kessler, is that he's a strong lecturer. Yes. In fact, when I, I had him on this podcast and I asked him where he gets that strength of the lecture, and he said Man Mansfield. Oh, okay. That's I've never what heard he said. him say that. Uh, but no, he actually said he said me. Man because I like to dig into it and I, and I asked him, you know, a little bit more about who his mentors were there and he Mansfield and Banfield. And oh, I think Banfield, Mansfield yeah. is, he's on YouTube a lot. I don't know about Banfield, but, but uh, Mansfield, if you, you can, you can watch him on YouTube and, and you get a sense for how systematic he is and you can just see he's, it's almost like he's reading it in his mind. He knows it so well. <laughs> and uh, so what's your teaching style? Like, do you. Mine is much more Socratic. I don't. Oh, okay. um, like oh. If you have me go and give a talk and I give a talk probably once or twice a month, various colleges across the country, mm. I'll have a, a, a set speech because uh, especially if it's on LinkedIn or Frederick Douglass, I, I want to get the quotes right. And um, Q and A is the time where I get the back and forth, but the Q and A right, right. that's more my teaching style. So oh, I, okay. I begin class with a question and oh. then I work off of what my students say in response to my questions. And if they don't have a response, I call on somebody, I say, turn to page 18. I have them read something. And then I ask my question again. <laughs> so it's very, we would say it's Socratic. In other words, it's very discussion based. I don't, I don't have a lecture that I read. I have notes that I may or may not look at. Um, but most of what I teach, I've taught a, a zillion times. Um, what do you teach? Form. What do you, what classes do you normally teach? And what's so your I teaching teach work? introductory classes on American government on political philosophy. Those are the two sections I'm teaching this fall. Hmm. I teach a sophomore junior level class on race inequality. So it's basically the greatest hits of black American political thought. Oh, and cool. then I teach my seminar on Abraham Lincoln. I've taught a course on the politics of Barack Obama. Oh, um, wow. I've taught a course on literature and politics. I've taught a course on Flannery O'Connor, a great Southern short story writer. Yeah, Catholic. Yeah. Uh, yes, pro, pro, very pious, uh, profoundly uh, pious Catholic. Um, mm -hmm. So political theory in American government are, are, are it's pretty much the broad categories of my teaching. And your teaching load is a, what is it, a 3-3? Three, three? It's a, a five and a half. So you teach six one year, five next, six, five, six, five. And then we have a sabbatical every fifth year. And, and how many students are in these classes? They're capped at 22 at the That's lower right. level and research seminars are capped at 14. So Doctor, we are really devoted to teaching. We are old school liberal arts. That oh, you, I love that. You come to Washington and Lee, not to sit in a lecture hall of 500 people. You come to get to know your professors and your peers, small class sizes. Very powerful. Um, and you're there. Yeah. Like all PhDs. Yeah. And That's so- so the students, they're coming there and they're, they're ready. They know what a Socratic style is. And they're, they they're, learn pretty quickly. <laughs> they learn pretty quickly. I yeah. find that some students don't quite understand what's going on with the Socratic and they, they, they like the uh, PowerPoint or whatever. Oh, I, I hate PowerPoint. That's a PowerPoint. No, 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 no. Yeah. They learn pretty quickly that I'm going to call on them and they need to be prepared to do that. Do but you I, let, you know, I, you know, you there allow are laptops. Kids. Do you allow laptops? I do. I do. I have some of my colleagues say don't. And mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm on the fence. I think if they didn't have their laptops, they'd probably be better students. But these are people yeah. who grew up on tablets and laptops. Yeah, it might be a little disorienting for them. I don't know. So, But I have some faculty who do not allow laptops to be open during class. And that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Anyway, oh, what I was going to say is, you're yeah. going to have some, some students, uh, you know, and most of us, I think, have, find it hard to, to express an opinion in front of 20 other people. That's true. So if I get a kid who hasn't spoken in two or three weeks um, and he finally decides to say something, and what comes out of his mouth is this Well, I think two plus two equals five. <laughs> I am not going to shoot that kid down. If that's the first time I hear from him, I'm going to build a bridge hmm. from how he got to five to what we all know the answer is, right? And so I'm going to go, huh, hmm. 
how'd you get to five? And invariably, if they get read, you direct them back to the passage they thought the answer was on. They read it out loud and they correct themselves. Oh, and I go, powerful. yes, yeah. there we go. There that's we far go. Far more powerful than you telling them. Yeah. And, and understood you can't do this all the time because you only have an hour and you've yeah. got this material that you want to go. Do, and I'm invariably, uh, we're behind in the reading, but it depending <laughs> Not on just the me, good. <laughs> yeah. Depending on the circumstances, especially if it's a kid who doesn't say much for, very often, I'm not going to shoot that kid down. Even if I'm dead to rights, you know, if I got him like, Oh, come on, where'd you get five? Of course it's four. Let me show you. I do that. I'm never going to hear from that kid again. So I'm trying to get, I'm trying to, to, to engender confidence in their ability to read something and reread it and figure out what's going on with a little assistance from up front. How did you stumble into that uh, way of teaching? Did you, does it come no naturally idea. or were you mentored into it? I have no idea. you was it? I've, I've of, told you my professors ran the gamut from yeah, Kessler's systematic right. analysis to Joshua's, yeah. you know, just, you know, uh, what is it, stream of consciousness, and Bill Allen's kind of in between those two. I, I saw a lot of different examples. James Nichols is, is kind of a lecturer, but kind of Socratic. His teacher was Alan Bloom. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. And he might have had some courses from Strauss. Uh, and so I, I just think for me, I want to turn the class into a conversation. And so uh, right. My style is conversational. And yeah. so that I, 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 I think that's a strength of mine and maybe that's yeah, something just absolutely. more comfortable with. Absolutely. It's a strength. It's very disarming. And I think when, when people are disarmed, they learn, uh, there's a different kind of learning that takes place when you're kind of in that, your nervous system is calm. You're not in <laughs> fight or flight. You're not in dorsal vagal shutdown. You're in rest and digest. And the conversation can if, if it's an interesting enough character uh, in which you are, Jaffa, of course, got away with murder because he was so interesting and quirky. Yes. yes. Um, not everybody could pull that off, but um, to see that you're able to pull off the dialogue. And I think it's masterful what you're able to do with the students, uh, because that's a, uh, it seems like the students are only getting, um, uh, more interesting here <laughs> you know, and i'm i'm at, sometimes i wonder if i'm keeping up with the times uh if they, if they look at me like i'm some kind of martian or something but um i i can have a style kind of i i think my style is most like yulman uh who was my professor and yulman i think when he was at his best he he was socratic he could also lecture, though, for yes. long periods of time. I've seen him teach. And he was incredibly funny. And he never laughed at his own jokes. And, <laughs> and I was the only one laughing, and I felt weird about it. But, you know, he, uh, he was a master at um, throwing something out there that you'd never thought about before and then just, just challenging you to explain it. Like... Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, the first time I ever heard about the Northwest Ordinance was from him. Oh, wow. And I uh, never read it. Um, I don't know how it escaped my, maybe I had, and I just did. You know how you read something as a kid and it just doesn't stick. And then you come sure. back to it as an adult and you're like, how yep. the heck did I miss that? Yep. Invisible um, Man by Ralph Ellison was a, my oh. exhibit A on that. I read that in a sophomore English honors class and I understood nothing. Zero. Hmm. And now I teach Invisible Man. I'm like, how can you read the prologue to that and not be blown away? But I, it, it was, it just wasn't for me when I was in high school. And now I, I, I've actually published on Ralph Ellison now. He's one of my favorite authors. Uh, but yeah, Invisible Man just made no sense to me when I was in high school. Dr. Merle, I have another question for you. One more question. Uh, if you could do it all over again, would you do the same thing for a living? Uh, oh yeah, for a living, it's it's clear. By the way, I was spared going to law school when I applied. <laughs> when I applied to grad school, I only applied to two grad schools. I applied to thirteen law schools. Oh wow! Yeah, and I got into some, didn't get into others, and I put my deposit down to go to Penn. But I was on a short-term mission in the Philippines when I graduated in 1987, and I wouldn't get back in time for orientation, and wow. so I asked for a deferment. And Penn said, "Fine, come back in a year." 
And after that summer, I decided to go to grad school instead. I didn't, um, so I was spared going to law school. And if I had to do over, I would, again, make the decision not to go to law school. I think I'd be a good lawyer, but I think I would have dried up inside. I love oh. what I do. I love, I, I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. honestly, I'm paid to teach students how to read. That's my job is pain is, is I'm paid to teach you to read with care. And it happens to be reading the stuff that I am most interested in, which is politics uh, or political philosophy, broadly speaking, um, or more, more actually more specific. Uh, and so I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure this is what I was meant to do. I need an audience and yeah. lawyers don't have an audience until the very end in a court. So That's I right. I, I I have an audience, which is great. It was I was in a similar position, uh, thinking about go to going to law school. I'll share this anecdote with you. It involves Michael Yulman. Um, he's the one that talked me out of going to law school um, <laughs> because I was teaching at the time. I was I was an adjunct professor of philosophy at, at Pepperdine University, and yeah, I was I made the long trip from Malibu to Claremont. I was trying oh. to think, where am I going to get my PhD? What am I going to do? Am I going to go to law school? I'm thinking about, I'm going to law school. This is back in 2007. And I was there on a, a Friday afternoon in the summer, or in the early summer, uh, maybe grades were still getting done or something. June, I think it was, well, it might've no, it was, it was May. It was definitely May. And so I thought, oh yeah, I came at the wrong day. I obviously there was one person around that was a tall, gangly, uh, jovial man, incredibly <laughs> jovial for a Friday. And uh, it was Michael Yulman. And I had no idea who he was. Beautiful man. And we talked for an hour. <clears throat> he did not know me from Adam. Huh. And he t he heard that I wanted to go to law school and I was thinking about what to do with my life. And he knew I taught logic and ethics and stuff. So he said, okay, so we just started talking and it turned into an hour, next thing you know. And he said, read Mary Ann Glendon's A Nation Under Lawyers. That's what he <laughs> said, I'm going to give you this assignment. Read Mary Ann Glendon, Nation Under Lawyers. And, uh, and so I did. And it was so horrifying to me. <laughs> so he, and he uh -huh. said, he said, it's not the same. He said, I'm an attorney. He said, I, I got my law degree at the University of Virginia before it was called a JD. It wasn't called that. It was called an LLB. So he was just teaching me. He was, he's like, let me tell you how it changed. And when it was back, when it was, when I was getting, it, it was very philosophical. And oh. uh, we read texts like the constitution. We took it seriously. And now it's a, it's a technician. It's, you know, it's almost like you're getting a refrigeration technology repair uh kind of a technician uh, minded, not a, not a scholarship minded thing. He said, if you want to study the law and you really want to get at the truth of things, not for an instrumental pur purpose right. uh, of uh, adversarial context, but um, you want a PhD. And so short story long <laughs> that I ended up studying with him for about a decade and um he was my mentor getting my phd in constitutional law uh -huh. there and um yeah i have fond memories of him um he was a delight uh in class do you consider yourself a straussian um i don't we, even know what that is to be honest we are with you, called but... west coast straussians because we are taught by people who were taught by strauss and yeah yeah, but have a and let's just say we're more sympathetic towards uh, the claims of revelation. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Uh, as opposed to those, that I think, on the East Coast who are much more philosophically driven, and that may make them agnostic, if not atheist. Um, I, it, it's hard to be mm -hmm. a straight up Straussian when you're an evangelical Christian. So I'm, I'm a, I guess Straussian is as a, as an adjective, but not a noun, would be accurate. Okay. And so you're saying the, the heritage of the Judeo-Christian heritage, is that channeled through Jaffa or how did that? No, it's, that... no, no. I mean, I became born again a year, you know, the year before I went to college. So oh. I'm in, I got that one, honestly. I gotcha. I gotcha. 
So no, not through, not through Jaffa. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. <clears throat> wow. How did that happen? You becoming born again, if you don't mind my asking. Um, it began with, and how did your parents feel about that? <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I won't bore you rough, with that. Yeah. Rough, uh, rough topic. But, but there's a little booklet and this is going to blow your mind because I would not recommend this, but there's a book called the four spiritual laws. Bill and Bright. Yeah. If you're familiar uh, with that, is it Bill uh, Bright? There's a, I don't know if that Bill Bright, I associate with campus crusade for Christ now known as crew, but that book says four things. Uh, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. One, number two, if I'm doing this off memory, number two, you're a sinful rebellious person and don't like to do the things God wants you to do. Number three, and this is the thing that at least began my journey to, um, uh, the Lordship of Christ over my life. The, the, th I think the third thing it talks about is the life, death and resurrection of Jesus, that, that Jesus, um, his death on the cross satisfied the punishment for all men's sins, right? Um, all descendants of Adam. And then the fourth part is that you need, you need to decide whether you're going to keep living according to your own dictates, or are you going to take direction from Jesus. And I remember vividly, this I do remember, there were two chairs that represent thrones, who's in control. And one chair has an S on it. And that stood for self. Mm -hmm. And there was an actual cross in the circle among many interests, but you're the one dictating things. And then next to it is a chair again, but the cross now was in the chair and the S was on the outside. And I looked at that and I wasn't very well read in the Bible. I went to church, was baptized, first communion, confirmed, all that kind of stuff. But I can't say that I was a daily, you know, a daily devoted to, to growing as a Christian. Hmm. But I looked at that picture and instantly knew the one with the S on the throne, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> but I also knew that the one with Jesus on the throne, that's the one that was correct. Hmm. That was the truth. But here's what happened. And I remember this as if it was this morning. I turned the page in the last page of the four spiritual laws is a prayer. And it is a prayer where you say, God, I'm a sinner and I deserve hell. I deserve eternal damnation for my rebellion against you. But I confess my sin and I give my life to be directed by Jesus. I started reading that prayer and did not want to accidentally give my life to the Lord until I was ready. So I <laughs> shut it closed <laughs> and wow. I put it away. And at that point, God started bringing a train of witnesses into my life who kept sharing, sharing, sharing. And ultimately I um, prayed the sinner's prayer, as we say, when I was doing an intern, I was working at Hughes Aircraft. This was when I was still an engineering major. Um, mm. Did I? Yeah, that's, this happened the summer before I went to college, I guess. Um, uh, part was of that my, in Fullerton? Where was the Hughes? No, no. Hughes Aircraft is in El Segundo. El Segundo. So it's okay. near the beach. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's LA where they were, By that point in time, they were making satellites and stuff. So anyway, okay. that, I, that's, that's my testimony is that wow. I became an evangelical Christian by hearing from uh, this, it started with that religious tract, and then it was just God bringing Christian people into my life who kept challenging me, and I ultimately decided, yeah, I'd rather have Jesus tell me what to do than try to do this on my own. Did you already have a high view of the Bible? Um, I was Catholic at the time, and therefore I knew that that was God's word for us, but I never right. read it. Yeah. When I went to campus, I um, became a part of Inner Varsity Christian Fellowship. And at that point, man, my faith took off. Oh. I read the Bible like crazy. Um, I led small groups, you know, did the large group leadership thing. I, that, I am that continued I, through your PhD. Oh, yeah. But mostly through undergrad. My, my years at Harvey Mudd and Claremont McKenna, I was hook, line, and sinker involved with Inner Varsity Christian Fellowship. Wow. Yeah. Was there a gap between your undergrad and your Claremont grad? Your uh, Claremont one, undergrad? One year. Claremont. Yeah, one year. Okay. Uh, I substitute taught for a year. How did you get your first teaching job at, after your PhD? 
At Claremont, they you you're as I said, the 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 vice of its virtue is since they have all PhDs, you can't teach if you're no, a PhD right. student. So no. the Claremont guys, Jim Nichols, Bill Allen, Charles Kessler, they were connected to professors at two colleges, Cal State San Bernardino and Azusa Pacific University. And APU is a Christian school. Yeah. And regardless of whether it's Christian or not, it was closer. So I and a fellow graduate student named RJ Pastrito, who now teaches at Hillsdale College, he and I shared an office as adjunct lecturers at uh, APU, Azusa Pacific University. And I cut my okay. teeth teaching at APU. Wow. Okay. How long did you do that for? I want to say two or three years. Yeah. Yeah. Not it's just long. down the road. It's, it's, it's not exactly down the street, but it's down the road a few miles. Down Foothill Carmel. Boulevard. Yes. Yeah. You, yeah. You make your way, you make your way west back towards LA, but don't get all the way there. Prestrito, he's the guy that does a lot on the, the progressives. Is that right? Yeah. yeah he is yeah, the yeah. leading authority on, on the progressivism in the United States. Is that right? Wow. Yeah. Well, I have one of his books on the progressives and I loved it. Well, oh, I'm going to have to write that down. So you say he's the leading guy, huh? I would say he, uh, I mean, I mean, he got to the progressives through Kessler and the rest of, you know, the usual suspects, but he and um, Brad Watson, who used to be at St. Vincent College. Sure, yeah, yeah. You know, they had that crazy kerfuffle with the invited speaker that they got mad at because he was critical of wokeness and whatnot. Anyway, so Brad oh, I Watson. I didn't hear about that. I don't, oh, I'm not yeah. up to speed on that. Okay. So Brad now is at um, the DC campus of Hillsdale College teaching the grad students there. So those two guys really, really focus on the progressives. But when I think of progressivism, the critique of progressivism, um, RJ is the guy that comes to mind. Now, are you still a Christian? Is that you? Is that yeah. your still your belief? Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, okay. no question. That's awesome. That's a that's quite a powerful story, and it and uh, I think it says a lot for your faith too that you're building into these young students, um, uh, helping them understand properly uh, the challenges of race in American history. Um, do you think that Christianity is a help to that work that you do? Um, or I don't are know there things I... in the Christian tradition that bother you as far as race goes? Well, I mean, to the extent that the Christian tradition involves real life human beings. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. after all, I mean, this is the second, read the Bible. Yeah. yeah. Well, this is the, this is the second inaugural, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, like it said, both right. sides pray to read the same Bible and pray to the same God. But notice they don't come to the same conclusion about slavery. Right. Uh, that I mean, that is the that is that was the American problem, uh, American theodicy there. So we had slavery, and we were not able peacefully to get rid of it. It took a war to get rid of slavery in this country, and the 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 fact that it took a war, in other words, it wasn't the product of no. Americans sitting down and realizing, yeah. you know, what, we've got to stop doing this. This is right, this right, right. Bad for not just bad for the enslaved; it's bad for the enslaver. Yep. Um, the fact that we could not politically, which is to say, peacefully, wean ourselves off of slavery—that is the American tragedy. That ultimately, it took a war to get rid of it, and of course, the the fruit of that part of it was bitter fruit. The failure of Reconstruction is a testimony to the yeah. fact that there was a significant portion of the white population that was unwilling to admit that what they were doing was wrong. And that failure to admit that, the insistence on some form of white supremacy in the South, which led to peonage, black codes, Jim Crow, legal segregation, all of that. I mean, you know, as, as Obama once said, and he wasn't the first one to say this, but what's the most segregated hour in the United States? Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. So yeah. and I would, I would, venture to say that that's probably still true. I'm not saying that, that, well, that's a whole other topic, but suffice it to say Christianity in and of itself did not cure people of racism. Are there biblical principles right. that can equip you to do that? Absolutely. Yeah. That's you're a good dealing way to with, it. as Flannery O'Connor puts it, always a recoil. <laughs> when you yeah. point people's sins, they don't immediately sure. appreciate it. No. They resist. Well, I don't appreciate it when people point out mine. So yeah, they're not going to, you know, it, it, it's interesting. The question of what Lincoln would say 
you mentioned Jim Crow. Had Lincoln been able to see the future, the thirteenth, fourteenth, fifteenth amendments, what and then the stuff that came out of that, um, culminating in let's say I don't know the civil rights movement the so-called civil rights movement of the fifties and sixties. What do you think Lincoln would have thought about the civil rights act and stuff like that of 64? Uh, do you think he would have been comfortable with the direction that that went? Yeah, that's a tough question because um, again, what complicates this massively is the fact that we are a federal system politically that yeah. good, good. No I mean, the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 comes at a time when so much government takes place at the federal level. Yeah. Whereas yeah. when Lincoln yeah. lived, yeah. most of government took place at the state level. Yeah. And so uh, I guess I'll answer your question this way, that the closest idea that we have of what Reconstruction would have looked like under Lincoln is what happened under the Grant administration. It would have required federal occupation of the South. That requires money and it requires people. And that happened for a while. Uh, Grant uh, all but destroyed the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, Lincoln would have the clout and the, uh, and the resolution to do something like that. I mean, domestic terrorism, yes. Uh, you think Lincoln would have gone after the Klan? Um, I think so. If, if, yeah. If, 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 uh, but well, uh, the first thing he would have done was to try to encourage the states to do their jobs. And, and he, we saw signs of that in 64 and 65 when Lincoln was trying to help Louisiana restore federal authority to their state. And, and when they were coming up with the new constitution, even though he had no authority as president to do this, he worked with generals and then eventually gave his one of his last public speeches, April 11th, 1865, he spoke about encouraging the education of black people. Remember the vast majority lived in the South and the vast majority were enslaved. To be equipped for freedom, you had to be educated. That was something that was illegal right. in many states. Right, 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 right. So number one on Lincoln's mind was two things, education of black people and the vote. And he knew calling for the vote was a controversial thing. And so he spoke of it for, as he put it, quote, the very intelligent and those who had served in the Union Army and Navy. Now notice, the very intelligent, whatever that means, did that just mean the literate? Did that mean, I mean, how do you measure intelligence? That's an yeah. open question. Right. That's on one end, you've got the very intelligent that sounds like a minority of the population, but then he says, and those who served, right? In other mm. words, regardless of whether they're, quote, very intelligent oh. end quote, or not, and what, so close to, it was 188,000 served in the Navy and Army at that time. That's a lot of people. A lot of people. Now, there are three to four million Black people in the United States, maybe a little more than four million um, when you include the free. But uh, Lincoln was attempting to do as president what he thought under the Constitution he had authority to do. It's a whole other question about what the uh, the Fourteenth and Fifteenth Amendments would have looked like right. because they may not have even that been necessary. Because mm. remember, those are largely the product of a president, Andrew Johnson, who was resisting congressional right. action right. to ensure that blacks could get a fair hearing in court, contracts enforced. Uh, it's you know basically civil political rights secured yeah. at the level. How did Andrew Johnson feel about the Klan? Because that started to form right during his presidency uh i don't know if it's during his that? presidency or or after but we know more importantly that he didn't think blacks were ready for the vote he was explicit about that in that respect he was no lincoln that's for sure but this is right. a whole other this is a whole yeah. other topic <laughs> sure absolutely yeah we're go getting off track there well we've uh kept you quite a long time here and um I wanted to refer back to your book again. The The book again is uh, Lincoln and the American Founding by uh, Dr. Lucas Morell, who teaches at Washington and Lee University in Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. And uh, it's published by Southern Illinois University Press. It's a lovely book. I'm, I'm using you. it myself uh, for class I'm teaching. And uh, we really appreciate 
Dr. Morell's time today. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Lucas. Had a, a, it was delightful to be here. Yeah, yeah. I had a great time.